Welcome to Spiritism 101, Lesson 7, Obsession. We're, we're going to discuss about the possibility that other spirits influence our thoughts. If we make the question, do spirits influence our thoughts and actions, what would you say? Kardec asked this very question to the spirits himself. In the spirits book, he asked this question and the answer of the spirit was the following. To a greater extent than you suppose, they can have a significant influence on both. Do you recognize it in your life? Do you feel the presence, their influence in your thoughts and actions? How so? how in control you are of your thoughts. Sometimes we think you are in control, but we barely know. So this is the reason why we are here, to understand that they influence us more than we imagine, in such a way that sometimes this influence may be persistent and unhealthy. Of course, we have guardian angels, mentors, loving spirits, influencing us to progress all the time. But sometimes we experience that in an unhealthy way. Not from mentors or guardian angels, but from earthbound spirits, from other minds, but maybe incarnate or discarnate minds who don't like us, who are jealous of us, or sometimes that want revenge from, uh, you know, choices we made in the past and hurt them. This is what we call obsession. When we talk about obsession, we define it as an unhealthy, persistent action and influence of uh, spirits onto others. Of course, you may think that only discarnate spirits may influence us in an unhealthy way or healthy way. Not necessarily. Sometimes incarnates may unhealthily influence persistently other incarnates. This is a case of addicted groups. They influence one another because uh, if we get out of addiction, what is going to happen to them? They feel we are abandoning them and they, they insist on making sure that we're going to continue to be addicted. Other times, some parents are so, so attached to their children that they may sometimes, because of that attachment, destroy their children's marriage. And that is also an obsession. Some people get sick because they are being obsessed by other minds, by other spirits. Not necessarily only discarnate spirits. Some people, they are so persistent in their unhealthy influence around us, or vice versa. We do it onto other people that we can make people sick by being jealous, by being proud, by being excessively egocentric. We can make people sick. But there are different types of obsession. In spiritism, Obsession is a very technical term that is defined, once again we will repeat, as this persistent, unhealthy influence of spirits onto other spirits. There are three different levels that were didactically uh, stated by Kardec in the Medium's book, Chapter 23. The first one is named Simple Obsession. Not simple because it's simple, because it's common, more common than we think. In simple obsession, we verify that the person is aware of that negative influence. For example, how many of us will feel, oh, I think that thought was not mine because I was feeling that angry, anger, that anger's not mine, so you feel it. But the persistent negative thought is there. And uh, we are on guard. So we are perceiving that the influence is happening, but it's happening, and it becomes an inconvenience. For example, 
Every time you go to work, you feel a headache. Well, there you go. Where's that coming from? It's not only a psychological uh, byproduct of uh, unhealthy relationships. It's actually the un byproduct of sometimes obsession. You know, some bosses, they are very, very egocentric and they are slave drivers. And we may resent it as headaches because their energy is not very healthy. And some employees or colleagues may also send out unhealthy thoughts towards us or towards other people, and we may resent it. But this is very common, so common that it, happen, it happens more often than not. But there is a second type of obsession, which we call, again, this a technical term in spiritism, fascination. Fascination happens and it's more serious because the person has a paralyzed judgment. That's what happened to Hitler and the people in Germany at the time. Hitler was fascinating. He was obsessing the people of Germany. And, uh, and, and the soldiers and everyone else, they had their judgment paralyzed. They truly believed they were doing the best that they could. They were obeying the rules, but they are being fascinated. Fascinated not in the common sense of the word fascination. This is a technical term, I repeat again. It's a, it's a second level of obsession. When we tell people, don't talk to that people. Don't talk to certain people because they are so and so. Well, sometimes we are fascinating one another and making other people's judgment paralyzed. We're gonna, we're gonna respond by doing so onto other people. And we also may be led as though blind. And how many mediums, they think, oh, you know, Jesus is speaking through me and is telling me that the world is going to end tomorrow. I'm sure about it. Well, my friend, you're fascinated by a spirit that is telling you that he is Jesus. But I would doubt if Jesus would do so. Jesus would ne never scare us out. Never give such types of, uh, you know, uh, advices. So, how many mediums are nowadays being fascinated by spirits who are just playing with them as if they were puppets? Because we are not ju using our judgment. And that's why Kardec said, the antidote to fascination is the use of reasoning. For spirit phenomena, use reasoning. They happen. But to identify the nature and the, the identity of that spirit, we need to realize why would such and such spirit come here and do this or do that? And realize, because good and kind spirits, they never tell anything bad about people. They, instead of saying, don't go talk to that person, they say, pray for that person. Even if that person is hurting you, they're not going to say, avoid that person. They are going to instead advise us to be kind, loving, and compassionate toward them. They never separate people. They unite people. So when a spirit comes to us and whispers, discord, separation, they are not good spirits. There is a whole chapter in the Medium's book about the identity of spirits. But now let's talk about the third and most dramatic case and type of obsession, which Kardec named as subjugation. Subjugation is an obsession in which the will of the person or the spirit is quite paralyzed. So they say, I want to get out of this addiction, but I can't. I don't know how. Well, that person is being subjugated by spirit. 
So that's why addictions are very intense and difficult to overcome unless the person conquers her will back to her, to her hands. And then we can overcome that subjugation. Or the person also acts in spite of him or herself. They say, oh, I wanted to do this, but you know, the opposite happened. I, I couldn't make it. Their will is blocked. The spirits dominated it. Why? If there is an absolute bondage of the spirit with that person. We're going to get to know why. The reasons why this happened. Who are the obsessors? So when we talk about fascination, my friends, just another highlight, it's important to know that in fascination there is an illusion which is produced by the direct action of a spirit on the person's thought and it paralyzes his or her judgment with regard to the communication that he or she receives. And also, the person cannot believe himself to be deceived. So you tell the person, oh, don't you see Jesus not talking through you because he would never cause separation? And you say, I'm sure Jesus is. Well, you're being fascinated. Not saying that Jesus couldn't talk to us. Of course Jesus can. Not only Jesus, but all the great spirits who take care of humankind. But here it's not about that possibility. It's about what they are devising to us. The identity of the spirit. We need to identify it. We need to understand what is behind those thoughts. The obsessing spirit in fascination leads his victim as though he were blind, making him accept the most ridiculous statements and theories as truth and exciting him to actions of the most insensitive compromising and de dangerous character. And in the case of subjugation, as you can see this picture of a puppet, in chapter 23 of the Medium's book, as we've mentioned before, in this case item 240, 40, a constraint paralyzes the will of the victim and make the victim act in spite of himself reducing him to a state of absolute bondage. It's very sad, and this is most of the cases of people whom we find in the psychiatric hospitals. So what is the difference between possession and subjugation? In Spiritism, we understand that the term possession implies a belief being a belief that beings are created for evil and perpetually doomed to evil. And in spiritism, that is not the case. Nobody is created for, to be ignorant forever. Nobody is created or doomed to evil. Nobody. So that's why the term possessed uh, doesn't make any sense, because it, it, it implies the idea that a stranger is taking possession of the victim. And in fact, there is a constraint, a very strong constraint, but not possession. Nobody can possess us. Why? For one reason. When we are reincarnating, for example, some people say, this spirit is possessing my body. Actually, no. Because your body is your home. If you're allowing the spirit to do it, Let's revisit what is behind it. Because we may unconsciously allow it, sometimes because of guilty feelings of previous lives' mistakes. We feel ashamed and we punish ourselves, allowing other spirits to constrain us in such a level that we may do things that are very, very, very sad. But when we reincarnate, molecule by molecule of our spiritual body is attached to the physical body. There's no way that another spirit can possess our body. Because energetically speaking, our body, physical and spiritual body, they are fully connected. There's no way for them to get in and break this connection. 
So in that sense, they can influence and constrain that bond between spiritual and physical body, but not possess it. That's why we don't use the term possession, but subjugation. We subjugate someone. And in this sense, we ask, who is the obsessor? Who is the obsessor? An inferior spirit. Not that the spirit is inferior in the sense that the spirit is out there and is inferior to us, but it's a spirit that has not evolved to a greater level. It's a nurse-bound spirit that was caught up in his or her own suffering and in life lived under events which caused rebellion and repression in emotions and death could not liberate him or her. So there is an unfinished business for this spirit, maybe incarnate or discarnate. How do we recognize, recognize obsession then? in our lives. First, when we observe that there is a persistent unhealthy thought or idea occurring to us. For example, you're living well with your husband or with your wife and now it comes to you thoughts of, you know, oh, maybe my husband or my wife is betraying me. I think my husband or my wife are cheating on me. And then you think, where is that coming from? There's no reason why I'm thinking of this. Well, that may be an idea that comes from unhealthy minds that don't want us to be happily married. Sometimes spirits who don't like our children, they may come to parents' minds and whisper, you see, your child is lazy. And you look around and say, no, my child is studying hard. And then they keep to whispering that on you and whispering and whispering. And one day you turn to your child and observe, there you go. My child is lazy. You see, they're not doing their homework. Well, problems that are created by unhealthy minds that sometimes don't want our children well, don't want our neighbor well, don't want our colleague well, and they whisper. And we give in to that unhealthy thought. Another way is the person's inability to see the untruth of the thought or idea. We simply believe it. Or the belief in the spirit's identity and the false and foolish things the spirit says. For example, someone comes and says, I'm Moses and I'm coming here to redefine the history of humankind, and you are the missionary that I need to fulfill my need, the need for humankind to change and improve it. Well, if I believe in that identity, I may be stepping in a very serious case of, case of fascination. Or praise that is heaped upon person from communicating spirits. It's a very well-known strategy of obsessors. When they want to dominate our minds, they praise us. They come to us and say, oh, you're wonderful, Vanessa. You're great. Oh, you're so wonderful. And they put my ego ooh, up there, inflating my ego. And I believe, oh, yeah, I'm the next best person in the world. And then I'm being obsessed because I am believing their praises. And uh, sometimes obsession can be recognized when uh, we avoid those people who may give us good and useful advice. And this happens in spiritist groups, in mediumistic teams. Sometimes mediums avoid the presence of uh, the coordinators, the leaders, because they say, oh, if you go there talking to them, they're going to advise you otherwise. But they are not aware. So they avoid. They say, I don't want to talk to that person because I don't like. They're going to say I'm wrong. Well, we better talk to them because it's good to have people telling us that sometimes we are not at the right path. We should bless people who tell us, I think you, sh you should think uh, twice before you do this or that. Instead of just saying, I don't want to be around them. 
because otherwise we may be among obsessing spirits. Persons who take offense at criticism of message. That's the case we just mentioned. And the incessant desire to write up without regard to time and place. Some people, when they become mediums, writing mediums, or uh, painting mediums, they say, oh, I want to paint and write all the time. Seeing mediums, speaking mediums. In the, I know mediums who in the middle of the street, like they don't know the people, and they come and say, hey, you, you know what? Let me just give you an advice, this and this and that. They are being obsessed. They are being fascinated. It's ridiculous to behave that way. That's why good mediums, they don't claim that they see, that they do. They are humble. Not everything that we mediums see and hear should be disclosed. Because if it were so, God would allow anyone to see and to communicate with spirits all the time. And we can recognize the obsession when there is a physical constraint that forces people to speak, just like we said, and act in spite of himself, lack of self-control. And when there are persistent noises and disturbances around the person that may cause the object to move around. This is all in the medium's book, item 243. So basically, obsession is about spirit attachment, in other words, that may occur when the person is vulnerable. And we may be vulnerable when we are sick, when we are experiencing grief, when we are experiencing emotional and physical trauma or inborn sensitivity. So then most of us, if not all, they, we have open doors for spirit attachment. So that's why it's good to find a good therapist to take care of our emotional traumas, physical traumas, our imbalances, good doctors, disorders of the brain function, like severe depression, drug misuse, and schizophrenia, they can be very open doors for spirit attachments. And um, there is a doctor in, in, in England, Alan Sanderson, he talks about an Andrew Powell. They talk about stories as true story as this one is, it's about James. He had uh, um, a problem with depression and alcoholism, abuse. He dropped out of university and found work in the art trade. At 28, his brother Ivor shot himself, and actually James found the body of, of his brother in a nocturnal search, and since then, James began to drink heavily and became chronically depressed. And James readily entered an altered state of consciousness and the brother Ivor spoke through him when he was treated by doctor to do this uh, uh, spirit release, as they say in spiritism, we call it this obsession. And then Ivor explained that he was now ready to move on, but said that their mothers need was holding him in the earth plane. So here we have a case of spirit attachment, Ivor on his brother James, not because Ivor didn't want uh, his brother James well, but because he was in need to tell, look, we need to teach mom how to be less attached to us because it's bothering me and I can't let go of this life. So after the treatment of spirit release, as they say in this clinic in England, Andrew Powell explained that the contact with his brother prepared James for letting go of his emotional ties with the mother. And uh, two more sessions were required for James' healing. And two years later, he was heavily married and working as a gardener and no reoccurrence of uh, depression and alcohol abuse happened in James' life. This is one of the cases, and you can read more about it in the book by Divaldo Franco. Through Divaldo Franco, the spirit Manuel Filomeno de Miranda brought a phenomenal story. You can read and you should read to understand more about the ins and outs of obsession when we study the case of uh, 
uh, a colonel and his daughter and his father and the problems that happened to them when in an evening of Esther's, his daughter's social debut within society, she had a crisis and basically through those problems, the whole family found themselves into obsession and uh, the spirit released through the spiritist is obsession treatment, which we shall talk about in the near future. So if we would summarize, what is the root of obsession? We don't want to get into obsession, do we? So how can we eliminate this problem if it happens or avoid it? So this is the key, self-discovery. Because our moral imperfections bring us under the power of obsessing spirits. And that the surest method of getting rid of this is to attract good spirits to us by the practice of virtue, which means Good spirits are more powerful than bad ones, and their will suffices to keep off the later. But they only assist those who second the action of their will by the efforts they themselves make of their own amendment. The day we find out inside of us that we need to improve ourselves always, to progress, to be charitable and to be kind, despite of our lack of resources, there's always a way to reach out to people with a beautiful smile, with kind words, by being good at listening to people's needs and to improve ourselves. When we do all those things, we are better protected and uh, it's less likely that in sphere spirits find open doors inside of ourselves. It's our moral imperfection that opens the doors for them to come in and play and unhealthily influence our lives. So the tool to combat obsession, the tools are inner transformation, the change of moral virtues and character, to resist, meaning to prove to the spirit that he will not be allowed to gain, the perseverance, that will tire the obsessor out by showing a patience greater than his persistence, by praying, in which we call upon the spirit spirits and our garden spirits for assistance, and also the spiritist passes, which is the energetic healing of the spirit spirit may also help us when we are being obsessed, and those obsession meetings in which we counsel the spirits who are obsessing and uh, to release their attachment um, onto obsessed people. So, to summarize, the antidote uh, to obsession is in our more improvements, because the more imperfections of the obsessed person is often an obstacle to his and her own liberation. That's why we say there are no victims. If you're being obsessed, my friend, don't feel yourself as a victim. You opened the door. Now let's together find a way to close the door and help those whom are feeling troubled and are in need of help. So let us close now reflecting on the concept of obsession.